Hi, this is Frank J. Avella with Awards Daily. Today in our Oscar Legends series, we have one of the most significant filmmakers of our time. His directorial credits include JFK, Platoon, Natural Born Killers, Born on the Fourth of July, Alexander, and Snowden. He's won three Academy Awards, two for directing, one for the Midnight Express screenplay, and he should have won a fourth for directing JFK. 30 years after that milestone film, he has crafted a follow-up documentary, JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass, which can currently be seen on Showtime. It's an extraordinary corroboration of much of the fact-based hypotheses he put forth in JFK. Welcome, Oliver Stone. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Oliver, uh, JFK created such a furor that it led to the declassification of some records. This documentary goes into some detail about what's been unearthed since. Did making this feel somewhat cathartic since it can be seen as validation after so many of the media attacked you after JFK? Well, yes, yes and no. I mean, it's good to make it. I'm glad it's out there. It's a record. They can't deny it. It's out there. It's a documentary. It's not a uh, dramatization. The important thing is that we got, we finally sealed up. We got some of these files open, not all. There's 20,000 still, I think about 20,000 still missing, but it goes a long way to proving the intelligence ties to Oswald. It goes a long way to indicting the Warren Commission for sloppy investigation, wherein there is all the original proof, all the original proof they cite is tainted. Not one thing can stand up in court today. It's the chain of custody is just not there. Additionally, we, we show how the, the Warren Commission was operating and we get into the reasons why Kennedy was killed. These are important issues, the why of Kennedy's death who benefited, what changed in America? What was the difference between Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy? These are huge issues. And the historians of our country have not dealt with it. They, they continue to, they have a strange picture of Kennedy, which doesn't hold up when you get into the details. So uh, I feel better about that. I don't feel so great about the fact that they, uh, the major media in our country and is not talking about the film at all. They, there is a black uh, blackout on this issue, truly, no, ma no major media. Uh, I, I, and uh, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, the financing was not there for the film when we started, we got it from England. And it was, the film was shown at Cannes in festival and also Deauville and also Rome festival. We, we made many deals in Europe, countries bought this thing, but in the US nothing happened until about two months ago when Showtime stepped in. It's been very frustrating. Yeah, this is really, what's going on. This is part of the censorship that they they claim is, is you know, I guess this is a bigger issue, obviously, in our country right now. But I'm surprised that they have gone to this level of deceit. It's really sad to hear. But, you know, it's fast, the doc delves into the autopsy, the insanity of Parkland. I mean, the, the magic bullet theory, you know, all of that debunked. And the two prior plots to kill Kennedy, which oh. so many of us weren't aware of. Well, a lot of people were aware of it, but it's yeah. never been talked about because the media will not cooperate. They kill off every story with denials and this and that, and people, they give up after 30 years, 60 years, 60 years actually, but we, yeah. we I had to get this right because my film, my reputation was at stake. I've been lambasted and called many things, but I, I just want a record out there. When I'm gone, it'll be out there. And there's a documentary at least that says I wasn't full of uh, horseshit. There's a four hour version floating around out there. Any yeah, chance we get to see that? Absolutely. I want you to see it. Uh, it's it's the it's a four hour version and it's in more detail, obviously. And I think it's very interesting. But, uh, you know, it's not commercial in that sense of getting it on uh, mainstream cable. So, no, uh, it's we're lucky to get the two hour on. But the four hour you, you will be able to see by January, February, I, I do think. Nice. Uh, there's still a slew of documents that remain uh, classified. You, oh. you recently wrote the column in The Hollywood Reporter about it. Trump said he'd released them and he reneged, and now Biden's suppressing them. I know I'm asking you to speculate, but what could be in those documents that makes oh. them so fearful? You could also speculate and say they, I'm sure they saw our film, this film here at Cannes, because they, or they saw it somewhere. So maybe that has a role in this because, you know, if they realized that we did a lot of work here and we pulled from what we could get, we pulled a lot of information. Yeah. So maybe there's maybe they're wised up and say, oh shit, we can't let Stone and his group get a hold of any more documents. <laughs> uh, you know, because he they work it, they work the documents. I mean, you have to be an expert to go into this stuff. 
but every little every word is significant. The details are important. I had a wonderful writer, a researcher, third generation, I'd say, or second generation uh, assassination researcher, Jim D. Eugenio, who has, has that ability to read everything and remember it, <laughs> which is sometimes very difficult when you read so many documents, but he's read everything on the assassination. And he wrote, he wrote the script and rewrote it and rewrote it and refined it. And that's, uh, we owe a lot to, to Jim and his book. Wow. Well, knowing what you know now, based on the, the trickling that's come out, would you change anything about the original JFK? Oh, sure. I mean, come on, we didn't, I didn't, we had to, we were intuitive on a lot of it, but basically the same thing is, I never changed off of that. That was a structure was clearly a CIA type operation run by possibly, probably agents of that, of that group and involved with the mafia involved with the Cuban community that wanted to kill Kennedy after he refused to invade Cuba. Those are the whys and the wherefores. Why didn't, Kennedy was supposed to go into Cuba. That was the deal. That was the thought they had it. The, the intelligence agencies and the military expected him to go into Cuba because it was communist. He didn't do that. He refused to send American troops into, into a war that probably would have ended up like Iraq. It would have been a mess. Yeah. Probably he was he was a man of he, with a military background and he didn't he had a, he saw war he understood war and when the general started talking so loosely about invading another country he was concerned I think rightly also they were also talking very loosely about nuclear war with Russia because we were so far ahead at that point we had an advantage that I think many people in the Pentagon wanted to blow up Russia and maybe take a significant amount of U.S. casualties but not enough. In other words, we would, we would win this nuclear war. They think you can win a nuclear war. And Kennedy thought that was crazy. He fought with them repeatedly from 61 to 63. So uh, people who tell you that Kennedy was a Cold War need to catch up on, they need to renew their information because it's outdated. And a lot of that comes from the old pictures. Well, Kennedy. you mentioned you mentioned the why, and that's something I wanted to talk about because JFK discusses the importance of the why. That echoes that there was a coup d'état with Johnson waiting in the wings, and whether Johnson knew or not, I think is important because he went on to take credit for a lot of what Kennedy started and reverse so many of his intentions. He reversed almost every intention, foreign policy wise. He went to a war in Vietnam that Kennedy clearly did not want to get into. No American, if, he, if he's not gonna to go to war in Cuba, which is 90 miles away, why would he go to war in Vietnam? He, that was the kind of logic that makes no sense. He had no intention and he made that very clear to Robert McNamara, his secretary of defense, as well as his national security advisor, uh, McGeorge Bundy. He, McNamara said in his book, after my movie came out, win or lose, Kennedy was pulling out of Vietnam. He was not gonna fight their war. Wow. That was, that's been distorted by historians and it continues to be distorted, but it's important we know this because every, in every way except civil rights, Johnson betrayed the Kennedy policies. And we go into that in the four hour in more detail. In, Af but, in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe, and of course in Asia. Take me through um, how you came to make JFK. What, how you summoned up the audacity to actually make that film. Oh, you know, at that time, I was perhaps naive uh, and thinking that, it, wow, this is a great murder mystery. This is a great story. And I didn't know much about it until I read Garrison's book, 1988. He wrote two books, and I got to know the people around the case, and not just Garrison, but it expanded into people from the, from the, administra from the administration and people in the CIA. I mean, when you get into this thing, you, you learn a lot more. It was a much bigger story than simply a Jim Garrison in New Orleans story. Yeah. That, was the, that was the basis on which we could at least get a handhold. You know, his trial did not work out, but he did unearth a lot of stuff. And uh, he was painted very poorly in the press, destroyed by the media in a sense, but he came back and he wrote this book and we made this movie. So it's a victory of sorts for the underdog, but we're not getting any help from the government. They don't want to have anything to do with this. Robert Kennedy, of course, did say he was going to go back in. He did say it, and he, among, to his associates, they knew that he had an intention to investigate this case. And he said, but I can't do anything until I'm president. I don't have the power. I can't make a scandal. He was right. Uh, he wouldn't have been successful. Unfortunately, he never, he never counted on being assassinated also. Right. That's what happened before he could become president. He would have been president in 68. You got and his son to speak in the uh, documentary as well. Say again? You got his son to speak in the documentary as well. 
Robert draws a very eloquent and sad picture of how shattered his father was at, yeah. when this happened. Uh, Oliver, tell me about assembling such an amazing cast for the film. Oh, for the original? Yeah. I would, uh, as I said, I was, I kind of was a beginner's luck. I mean, I went, Warner Brothers loved me at that time. And, you know, I had done Born on the Fourth of July. I'd done uh, Wall Street, Platoon. So you know, I was hot, you know, and they really wanted to be in business with me. And I said, let's do a murder. Mis let's make this a, let's make this like a, a suspense murder story in Dallas with the president. They liked the idea and, and it worked. <laughs> the film made a fortune for them and worked all internationally, by the way. It wasn't just, I think the only country where it didn't do any business was New Zealand. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, it really worked. And, uh, but then the administration at Warner Brothers changed and they were bought up by, uh, I think AT&T now. So it's all changed, you know, it's more of a conglomerate, more of a corporation. In those days, it was Steve Ross who was the chairman and he believed in independent thought. Well, you got, you got some uh, great performances, uh, you know, from that film. And I was, I was fascinated by the Academy recognition. I, th I think they were honestly afraid of rewarding you for JFK. I couldn't believe Costner wasn't nominated or Oldman, who I thought really embodied that. And that was the one time that the Hollywood Foreign Press got it right. Yes, they did, actually. You're right. Yeah. It's not, the, not the one time, but they. they no, they, I mean, um, over the Academy. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a very astute observation. No, the, uh, the, the, the animus against the film by the time the Oscars rolled around was intense. And Jack Valenti, who was the head of the Motion Picture Association at that time, launched a, a major attack on the film. He had been Lyndon Johnson's aide, as you know, his, yeah. one of his closest advisors. So uh, that and people were timing their articles to be in the trades, everything they could do to lobby against the film. So by the time we hit the Academy, it was a disappointing night because uh, we won two Oscars uh, for editing and photography. Yeah. Which says a lot about the film, but nothing uh, in the major categories. And I think Kevin was robbed in the sense that there, he's a very important, you see Kevin anchors the film. Without Kevin, you don't have that through line. Yeah. Had a great cast because they were smaller roles and they were people were willing to do them because they believed in the they believed in the scenario. And that that question, uh, I I was um, in uh, college when I saw it, and the question who mourns for Lee Harvey Oswald that haunted me, you know. And and to this day, these scapegoats, these historical patsies, even if he was guilty, doesn't he deserve someone to give a damn about him? It's something that has always stayed with me. Well, he never got a trial. He was he was a vigilante justice. He was shot down. He had to be closed. He had to be shot down because if he had talked, you know, he talked for about fifteen hours to the to the Dallas police force. We have no record of what he said. But he, if you if you look at those little clips of him in the hallway with the when he passes through, he keeps saying, "I need a lawyer. I did not do this." Nobody who shoots a president who's a the, the supposed fanatic that he's supposed to be would not take credit for it. He'd be very happy and say, yeah. yeah, down with tyrants like John Wilkes Booth. This is not at all that case. He kept insisting, I need a lawyer. Couldn't get it. And they shut him up, man. They shut they, him up. They certainly did. Uh, what, what kind of world would we be living in today had Kennedy lived? Different, different. There would have been no Vietnam War, I guarantee you. I guarantee you, positively. And in that case, it, sh it sets up a whole different scenario for the post uh, World War II era in America without Vietnam. You see, that Vietnam War has permitted us to recycle the idea of warfare and preparing for war, which is the important thing in America. Preparing for a war is where we spend the money. Uh, military industrial budget never changes. It goes up and up and up. The intelligence agencies don't change. They stay around forever. They spend whatever they're gonna do. No one can confront them. And Kennedy said the same thing to De Gaulle. He said, I'm not fully in charge of this government. And that was what he told Khrushchev too, because his brother did, because during the missile crisis, both men, the Soviet premier and the American president were very aware of the hardliners in their own administrations. They were the ones who were the most dangerous. So the United States has these hardliners still in all over Washington, they're still there. Those are the guys who went to Iraq. Those are the guys who went to Afghanistan. Those are the guys who believe in this enforcement mentality. If you remember Kennedy's peace speech, he says, a, a peace, a real peace, not 
governed by American weapons of war, not a Pax Americana governed by weapons of war. That says it all. Yeah. He was a completely, he was the only one who tried to change it and he could be changed at that point. His dream was to have, and of course with his brother behind him, he had a possibility of an eight years or uh, of a 12 year, 16 year term, you know, the Kennedys. And they would have remade, they would have remade that world. Uh, one thing I don't think you ever get enough credit for is the filmmaking in JFK. Uh, it is um, absolutely incredible filmmaking, the way you weave um, real footage with, uh, you know, I mean, it, it is a great story. And I think you and Sklar do this, do, with, with the screenplay, do this magnificent work. You draw us in and you draw us in with these, this, this, these factual, details but you make it into something really really compelling and i don't think there was anything up to that point that was quite like jfk i, I kind of agree i think it's a very original film and it certainly shocked a lot of people at the time uh i i don't i hope it doesn't disappear down the memory hole i really don't uh but you never know with present day american television you know they they cycle films through that are sort of non controversial you know yeah there's a fear of controversy in this country it's a shame uh, we can't we cannot get real stuff on the air not enough and uh it's it's bedeviled my career to a certain degree you know there was no financing for this film in america we got it out of england for the yeah. documentary and also no we had no media platform we we sold at Cannes film festival we sold 10 11 countries we went to Deauville, we went to Rome, tremendous, tremendous response. We come in America and it was a difficult thing. We were very lucky to get Showtime to put up a platform on it. Very yeah, that's, that's crazy. Um, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna switch gears right now and uh, at, go back to the start of your career a little bit and uh, ask you um, if you, I, I know that you went to NYU after Vietnam. Is that when you fell in love with movie making? Yes, you could say that I wanted to make movies after the NYU experience, yes. Okay. Uh, you wrote in Chasing the Light, which I just devoured a second time, um, okay. about how Alan Parker pretty much banished you from any of the post-film events <laughs> while you were making Midnight Express, uh, it, which is ironic because you and Marauder were the ones who, uh, who went on to win the Oscars for that. But. There was a lot of irony in that. Yeah, I could see there was tremendous disappointment in Parker's face. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you a specific question about Midnight Express, um, a, 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 about the scene between Billy and Eric that a lot of people talk about. And it, this gets recycled because, you know, Billy Haynes, Hayes years later, you know, said he was gay and all of that. But uh, was there any pressure to, to script it in, in the manner so that he says no? That's correct. It, yes, there was pressure. Uh, as I remember in the original script, yes, uh, I think, I, I, I think it went the other way. Uh, he, he, uh, no, no big deal for, for you know, to me, uh, homosexuality is, the truth is that Billy, I didn't know it at the time, Billy uh, revealed all this over the, over the next 20, 30 years. And above all, he revealed, which has stunned me when it came out, he revealed in an interview that he had smuggled drugs out of Turkey before. <laughs> so I had written the movie on the basis that it was his first time and he was a relative innocent. How wrong I was, he'd already done it three times. He was a car he was an operator and he the way he handled the whole film, the way he, the way he handled the movie and the publicity and I think even Island Parker was threatened by I me. Mean, the, the producers he was a loose cannon and uh, but this was this revelation shocked me because I had the impression from him that he was innocent. Well, well, I'm I'm glad to finally clarify that because I had a feeling that there was pressure about that sequence, and I'm I'm happy to hear. Uh, it's, it's it was so fascinating in your book to read the various things that you turned down, like Top Gun, uh, and and I, I wanted to ask you, it's like I'm I'm happy you did turn it down because I'm so tired of these gung ho, you know, warmongering films. When are those films going to stop being so popular? Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't look like it. The American new generation loves the, uh, the computer game aspect, video game aspect of all the action. 
you know, they're trying to make those kind of films without thinking with good faces on the screen and it becomes a, like a computer game. You just wipe out the enemy. It's uh, not the right, it's not the right value system to put into our population, to put it to our young people, not at all. And I'm, I'm, on, I'm, a, I'm a dinosaur here. Uh, <laughs> I've tried to show realistic war. I've tried to show the, the cost of it in Born on the Fourth of July and Salvador. I mean, it's just doesn't seem to get through as a popular, it's better to kill the enemy than to understand them. Well, you know, you write very honestly about the insanities involved in uh, Salvador and Platoon and getting them made. Um, yeah. And they're both released in the same year. And then all of a sudden, you're bell of the ball. Uh, yeah. Does that remain the most fulfilling time for you? At what time? The most fulfilling time for you. Well. In yes, your career. Yes and no. I mean, it was a great moment. You have to believe that after all these years of rejection, that all of a sudden I have two films in the same year that don't get Oscar nominations. And for Salvador, we got screenplay, me and Richard Boyle, and, and Jimmy Woods got a nomination and really came very close to winning. Yeah, they, he would have won if, if it hadn't been Paul Newman's seventh or eighth try, which was a sentimental favorite, but uh, that's what happened. So Jimmy was really, he was great in the film and uh, Platoon at the same time got so many Oscar nominations and I actually won for best picture and for best director, which is lovely, not for screenplay but I was competing against myself on screenplay. Yeah. So that was some night. Yeah, it was a great night. I wrote about it in Chasing the Light. Yeah. Very important. It's very important for after, after, many, after my, many failures, so to speak, that you have some validation. Success is just as important as failure. You can learn from both. Well, you stopped the Hannah juggernaut too. I remember, I was young, but I remember Hannah and her sisters was this juggernaut uh, most of the year was going to win. And then all of a sudden platoon came along and that was it. Oh, that's right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I loved also reading about- It was a miracle. The we came out of the blue. It came out Christmas. We didn't have a big release because Orion didn't put a lot of money into it. But frankly, the picture took off on its own, on its own. I mean, it didn't matter. Critics didn't matter. It was just people were coming to see it because they felt that there was an honesty there that they had not seen in Sylvester Stallone films or Chuck Norris films or in the other Vietnam films. Yeah. Well, then a year later, um, there's Wall Street. And of course, Michael Douglas won the Oscar. Um, yeah. Incredible performance. Uh, and I wanted to specifically ask you, it's so interesting how all of a sudden Gordon Gecko gets embraced as um, this heroic character. Uh, he's certainly a fascinating character. I don't know if I'd call him a hero. Um, and there's Trump parallels there uh, that I find fascinating. What are your thoughts? Well, yes. Uh, no, Gordon Gecko was the second character in the movie. It's a story about Charlie Sheen and a young man, the temptations of a young man on Wall Street, who he takes, he, he, he becomes corrupt, but in his soul, he doesn't feel good about it. And he ends up changing at the end of the movie and and uh, and turning uh, turning gecko into the authorities or trying to yeah and he himself has to go to jail but it's a very satisfying ending to me but it's a moral ending and i don't know if that's most popular because most of the kids come up and they say you know because of that movie i loved gordon gecko so much i was i went to wall street i changed my changed my major from biochemistry to to uh, finance and uh, as a result a lot of them a lot of these people made a fortune. I think if I had a commission on some of these fortunes, I could have uh, really scored, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, the, the, uh, it's a shame. It's not true. I mean, Gecko is the, is, the, is the villain of the piece. And that was the way it was approached and shot. But Michael was charming as, and that's why I wanted them in the role because I knew he could be charming. Yeah. No, he certainly was. Um, in Chasing the Light, what another thing I found fascinating was you talk about how Born on the Fourth came so close to being made with Al Pacino. Yeah. Uh, I kept wondering what that would have been like had you been the director. Well, and, at that time, no, I wasn't the director. I was the writer. Yeah. And years, and Al was already getting too old in 1978 for that role. So eventually, I never thought it'd come back to me. It's so weird that it did but it never got made. It was heartbreaking for Ron Kovic and for me. It took 10 years later after platoon success, it rolled around again and people said, well, maybe we should take a shot on this, on this 
graphic anti-war movie, and they did. And we, it was, the money was tight. We made the movie. It wouldn't have happened also without Tom Cruise, who was excellent in the movie, and he yeah. worked very hard. So Tom uh, and me put this thing over on the system, and frankly, it did very well. Internationally, again, not as big as Platoon, but certainly very well. Arguably one of his best performances. And then again, there you are on Oscar night and you justly won for best director. But again, there, there seemed to be sort of this backlash because dry, uh, no offense to Driving Miss Daisy, but to me, it's one of the blandest films to ever win best picture. I, I did just, it confounded me. Uh, I think there was a backlash, yes. Uh, I think a lot of people, who knows, I can't really, dis I don't know how the Oscar, the Oscar <laughs> thing seems like a high school election to me. It just, you know, you have to realize that people like Harvey Weinstein were already working the publicity angles deep. Well, I didn't know about all the games that you could play. When you go after the critics, you get all these groups to back you at the end of the year, and it's very publicity oriented. It's like a high school election. I, I hate those games, and I'm not good at it. Yeah, but, you're uh, right. He was there that early. You're absolutely right. Yeah, he was he was pushing for my left foot, which was yeah. his movie, and he got it. And he actually upset the Tom Cruise thing, and he he got Daniel Day Lewis his first Oscar. Yeah, yeah. And a performance that few people saw actually. Yeah, and he got uh, Brenda Fricker too, who nobody had ever heard of. That's very true. Um, well, okay, 1991. You had yet another double year with The Doors and JFK. Uh, I saw the doors opening night at the Ziegfeld. I was standing in this long line, yet manic audience, and, and I ended up in the front row. What an experience. Did, did you watch that film with an audience, and what was it front, like? You can't watch it from the front row. You're going to see pixels. It was uh, insane. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, but I'm, I, I remember that night. I went down there to the theater. Yeah, it was great. It was wonderful. I love the doors, and I'm, I wish, uh, I would, they'd come out on different years, but anyway, I'm glad I made it. And it was a hell of a time. I was working double time, it seemed, overtime. I was just really exhausting myself because I wanted to make JFK by the end of the year because I didn't want it to be cut. The film was three hours and 10 minutes and we were rushing to get it out by Christmas. Because, and we told uh, uh, Warner Brothers, if you want to make changes, we, it's, we're going to have to delay the film until uh, the spring. They wanted it for Christmas and they're right. And uh, thank God we weren't forced because if they screen, that's the problem with screening films. If you screen JFK, you're gonna have a thousand different directions. Gonna, people are gonna say, do this, do this. And you can't, you can't base, uh, you really can't base your final cuts on previews. They're very dangerous. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, agreed. And you, you got such a great performance out of Val Kilmer in uh, The Doors. I think it's his best performance. Uh, yeah, uh, and Heaven and Earth, I also think, is a film that gets oh, you. tossed under the carpet, and it is such a great, it's part of the trilogy, and it is such a wonderful end to the trilogy. Yeah, that was part of the backlash. I think by that time, uh, Oliver Stone making Vietnam films was not the thing, uh, and making a film about the other side of the war, which was important to me, a woman in a village, true story, who ends up in a, in a chaotic situation with, with America invading uh, Vietnam. It's a great story, all true. She ends up in America and, and becomes a, a, you know, a, by, by a, a woman who lives in two countries. Beautiful ending to that movie, beautiful story. Yeah, yeah, it was lovely. Well, you know, it's there forever, thank God. Um, Natural Born Killers to this day, the look and style of that film so groundbreaking that I think very few films have ever tried to copy it. When it first came out, I remember turning to colleagues of mine thinking people are going to be looking at this film decades from now. I'm fascinated still. I just watched it again two nights ago. And mm -hmm. the look of that film looks like it, it, it was made two decades from now. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's, we, we did a lot of experimentation on that film. It was one of the fastest films ever we ever made. And it was also more cuts in that film than I believe had ever been made on a film. So we were playing with the edges of the film technology. And uh, we owe a lot to Bob Richardson, who did the cinematography, as well as Hank Corwin and his editors on, on, the, uh, on the editing side. We worked very long and hard on the film. After it was finished, we did about almost a year of editing. 
well worth it. But again, a lot of controversy over, over violence, uh, uh, which I think the satiric intent of the film was lost on so many people. They take things very literally in America. Yeah, yeah, they force you to cut it to pieces, but the director's cut is there. Yes, oh, that one I fought for, Jesus. And it's still, uh, even Warner Bros. still doesn't release it. I mean, they released it once, but they, the new regime won't do that. So if you have a cut, please make sure you keep it. Yeah. Um, and Mallory is, uh, you know, people who talk about how, you know, you don't write women, a fe strong female parts. There's a great strong female character there. No, My God. Cool. She's lovely. And in the next film also, Joan Allen got an Academy Award nomination for playing uh, Richard Nixon's wife. And that's a very complex film, the Nixon film. Not seen enough because it's three hours and 15 minutes. I, but I love that film. It's got so much character and depth. Uh, Anthony Hopkins understanding of the role and his relationship with Joan is a beautiful movie for me. I think it was misunderstood by liberals as an apologia for the man, but it's not. It's, it's trying to understand his, this important historical figure who never felt comfortable in his own skin, which I think we can all relate to. <laughs> Talk about misunderstandings. It seems to be the curse of my life. <laughs> in, my high school, in my high school yearbook, they said, to be misunderstood. That was my quote. I don't know, the editor picked it up. To be misunderstood, it was an Emerson quote, Ralph Waldo. To be, to be misunderstood is to be great. Well, that certainly backfired on me. Uh, wow. Well, um, Oliver, I have a, an Evita question because uh, I know that you were originally going to make the film with Meryl Streep. And uh, what we have now is a mess. Uh, how did that fall apart? Uh, well, Meryl's scheduling, my scheduling, I went into the doors and she'd already committed to, when, 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 by the time she, she said yes to, the, to, uh, to Evita, I'd committed to the doors. So if she had come, out, she'd come aboard when we asked her to, I think we would have gotten the film made with her. She was terrific, good voice good voice and a great actress. It's what I wanted for the role, not Madonna. I mean, that is, it's unfortunate that that film got made the way it did. Yeah. There again, I, I, ran, I ran into Alan Parker again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's very ironic because you got screenplay credit there. And when I was watching the film, I could see the scenes that you mapped out. I really could. They were, they were the most exciting scenes. <laughs> it's too bad. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna uh, talk about Alexander because I've seen every version. I think it's an extraordinary film. I think it's one of my favorites of your films. Wow. Uh, the last two versions anyway. Uh, I really appreciate how you didn't shy away from the same sex love in that film. Bravo for having the balls and the sensitivity in that film. Thank you, Frank. I, you're, I'm now on your fan list because uh, that is another misunderstood film and I, I really had to dig it out. I mean, I had so many problems with Warner Brothers. I, there was a new regime at that point, and they were mostly concerned that it had to be under three hours, you know, and I, I couldn't do it, and I, except by cutting the shit out of it. And I had to go back to a longer film in order to make it understood. Mm. And that's what I finally did in the 2007 version, the, which is called The Final Cut, yeah. I think it is the best one for me. Yeah. I, I, again, I've, uh, I go back to Alexander all the time uh, for some reason. I just find it so fascinating the way, the way you tell this story. And um, I, I love those, la both of them, the, uh, the, I have them right here, actually. Uh, both those last two versions. The, the 2004 is the original theatrical. The 2007 is the final cut. There's yeah. Two other cuts, but you can ignore those because whatever reasons I'm not gonna give, but it was a battle. It was a battle to get the 2007, it did very well on DVD, but people were after me at that point. It was uh, really, some of the reviews were really nasty. Uh, it's such a shame. I think it's another film though, that is gonna, gonna stand the test of time. And it's, it's a shame it, it couldn't get the acknowledgement when it was made. That's a big one, yeah. That's a huge one for me. That was a real setback. With uh, it's interesting because managed to have a career in spite of it. <laughs> well, it's interesting with Savages I, again. I, I was fa I'm fascinated by the homoerotic take between Aaron and Taylor's characters. You're not afraid to show men loving one another on screen, whether it goes that one step further to sexual or not. And I, I really do applaud you for that. You're you're willing to explore that. Thank you, Frank. I uh, think it was 
Alexander is pretty bold. I mean, not only does he have a, a homosexual relationship, friendship really at that time with uh, Hephaestion, but he also has a relationship with a, with a eunuch. And that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Pagoas. And we went into the third sex, the concept of the third sex. Alexander was a tremendous explorer. He wanted to go to the end of the world and back. That's why we did those scenes in the mountains where he looks at the future. He looks at the, I can't go any further here. To, I have to go south to India. And he's, he's so disappointed that you sense that he wants to really, really go everywhere in the world and do everything in his lifetime. Overachiever, I suppose. Oh, big time, right? Um, okay, uh, Snowden question, and then I have two more for you. Uh, Snowden had the audacity to put forth this idea that we should be able to question our government and hold it accountable, something that seems to have now gone to a certain kind of hell. That's true. That's very true. People are too passive about this. They accept this concept of surveillance on their lives and they feel hopeless and helpless. They just can't do anything about it. Uh, I just am so disappointed on the misunderstanding that Snowden had too, because he didn't, he didn't get a break. Uh, people don't understand what he did. And I, I'm, in that regard, I'm also very pro uh, Julian Assange. What he did and achieved was yeah. crucial. He revealed crimes, war crimes of significance and bad behavior on the parts of government and that embarrassed them it's the reason they're after him yeah they've yeah. kept they treated him like a dog they put him in a prison bell marsh one of the high security prisons they've denied him bail oh, it's it's a horror story what they've done to him trying to kill him really basically oh and more power to you for telling these stories i know i know that film had a lousy release yes it did that was another one it was an independent and they just did a lousy job they should have released it in Cannes, which is where I wanted it to go. They didn't. Okay. Uh, untold history of the United States. Highly uh, ambitious one. series. He's oh my God. <laughs> well, it's extremely outside the box. It demanded we look at history in a different way. And see, my husband's a, a, a US history teacher and we watched this together, glued to it, beyond fascinated. We Because we, we spend our lives being taught that th these uh, things are strictly from a US centric perspective. And to see history being documented the way you guys did in this more egalitarian manner was Absolutely eye-opening. And I just wish that this would be seen everywhere. Oh man, you, uh, Frank, I have to uh, thank you. That's really, you're really, I wish you're like the new Roger Ebert for me. <laughs> <But> <laughs> thank God you're open. You're an open man and you're open to intelligent discussion of history. I, I bless you for that because I can't believe how narrow-minded some of these American people who write about film are. You know, it's just, they don't want to go against this grain that uh, which I would call American exceptionalism. The, C the history series was a long deal. That was five, five years with Peter Kuznick was my co-author and we worked very hard on, revised it several times in getting the facts right. It's a beautiful, beautiful series. And I love it the, is. I love the music job. Please, if you have a chance, uh, recommend it. Oh, and, I do all the time and, and I recommend the book, but it's easier to, I think, watch the series, which is so I fascinating. Uh, Oliver, I have one more question for you. I could obviously spend an eternity speaking with you. I think you're so yeah, eloquent, smart, and you're so important to film history. You've always managed to make the films you wanted to make, at least up to this point. What is your next passion project or pop projects and how are you going to get them made? That's a little hard to answer right now because these things have to be kept confidential until you're ready to go. I have a documentary out now, the JFK, and I also am finishing up another documentary about clean energy, which I hope will come out early next year. Very important documentary because it's an important issue. And we talk about energy realistically, all of it's a fact-based, I did it with a scientist. We're trying to show what the world is doing, what the various countries, Asia, uh, Europe, United States, and what's going on in that, and how many, all the different interests which are behind, you know, certain countries have an interest in this and that. So we want it, we talk about all that very clearly. And I think it's crucial that people understand the world picture of energy, the world picture, uh, not, not the US centric one, which is what we get here. Well, you know, with your next feature, I would love to see you work with Jane Fonda. I think the mm -hmm. two of you together would be magnificent. I don't think she'd be too happy with my clean energy because 
we, we, we you know, uh, okay, we'll get into that another time. I have to pee. I have really been sick. Go. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, Frank, very much.